Aloha. Uh, sorry, I'm a little late. Uh, uh, talking to Chief of Staff. <laughs> getting caught up in all the things with the governor. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is, uh, uh, first of all, wh what do you think about that keynote, Open Roads? My goodness, what a great job, wasn't it? <clears throat> That's probably the best uh, one I've seen in 30 years, in my view. It just It touches your heart. It really opens your mind, touches your heart. So today what we're going to talk about is open government and, and, and data governance. So it's, data governance is, you know, what I was talking about was open and closed. So what we're going to talk about here is that what is data governance? So data governance is talking about first uh, uh, that we want to solve some challenges here, right? We are going to ask four questions in this session. First, that as governments are in increasingly uh, sharing information with each other, not only uh, within the government, but also what we're sharing outside the government, we have to look at where do you start and who should drive all this data uh, sharing and, and information sharing to solve problems. It's all about data. We also have to have open roads and open minds, of course, to how we look at problems. But at the end of the day, data is what drives. It's the lifeblood of most organizations. Who owns the data? How should we keep it secure? Some should be open, some should be closed. And what standards should we use? I mean, these are questions that we need to answer. I think the main thing that we'll come out of this session, and we have a distinguished panelist, set of panelists here, is that we want to make sure that this is also aligning with the plan. As you heard the keynote, it's all about we have this vision, we know where we want to go, but we also have a plan. This lines up with the governor's New Day vision, of course, in terms of transforming government, and also sustainable economy, growing a sustainable economy, and investing in a workforce. But at the end of the day, it also looks at transparency and accountability so that we can look at open government and how we make this thing happen. Data is changing every day. Data are, is what we call facts and statistics that work together and are collected together for reference and for analysis. But governance is the act of how do we put it together and make use of this to solve policy, but it's either a separate process or decision making. It's everything that we need in terms of the whole life cycle of data as it becomes information that we use in our daily lives. So Patricia Siebold is a famous architect, and she came up with this famous expression that data with context becomes information. And today you heard that in, from a photographer. That was way cool. Information with experience is knowledge. And he said it, knowledge plus understanding is wisdom. I couldn't have said any better, and we did not rehearse this, by the way. I was blown away by what he was talking about. That's what we're all after, but we just let's first get to data, good data. Data will grow by 800% in the next five years with 80% unstructured text and media. That means that you have to find a context and figure out how to label that information and find, you know, like what they call index and so on and so forth. It's very hard to look at that context. And so data just keeps moving. There's just incredible amount of volume of that moving around. In the federal government, they have set up the Privacy Act, the Information Quality Act. They've got the Espionage Act, which is talking about leaking for security purposes. They've got AG guidelines. The previous uh, AG guidelines was protect everything, share what you must. The new Attorney General guidelines under President Obama is share everything, protect what you must. So previous one was protect everything, share what you must. Now it's share everything, protect what you must. You see the difference. The difference is now that the President has come up also with his open government uh, uh, platform which allows that the data belongs to the people. The government does not have the monopoly on the best ideas, that you can use data and, and come up with solutions that you need in your daily lives. The Hawaii state government, under the great leadership of our governor, Neil Abercrombie, has also put out an open data uh, uh, bill that is signed that came in from the citizens and was supported by the legislature and came through a process. And it's a great mirror of some of the things that we're doing that is changing the world. The open data bill that the president signed has changed the world. There are 50 countries now that are subscribing to it. All the states are, are working in, 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 in this context. But it's a very powerful idea. It's about citizens and their government. But we still have to make sure that we protect privacy, protect security, and maintain information quality. As this information is growing by 800% every five years with 80% unstructured text and media, you saw the vision that I put out there. It's really simple. On the left, our citizens and residents. And on the right is data, either open or closed, and we need access to it. So that information sharing is required not only within, meaning government, 
but also outside. But we need to protect that information. We do not want to share the SSN numbers and, and other, other privacy information that has to be protected at all times. But other information that can be used to solve problems should be open. So how do we do that? We want it available through our portal, hawaii.gov or myhawaii.gov. And on any device, as you know, I told you the mobile devices is changing the world. We've got 57 apps and 100 online services. But we're only 5% there so far. But our administration is doing something about it. And we're going to open the rest of it and move forward while keeping the rest of it secure. So here's what happens when you have open and, and closed data. The legacy data stays in silos. Have you heard of silos? We call them silos of excellence, just to be nice. <laughs> yeah, simply put another way, they're closed databases where you say, hey, no can, come in, you know, no can. We want to change that where you can protect that, but it's certain information if you start sharing, you can get all kinds of, of ways to solve problems. On the right is open data where we can put some of this information out so we can use that. And when you put things, things together, you do some amazing things. On the left here, on two, in 2009, when we first, when the president signed this into law, uh, I, I was minding my own business, being the CIO of Interior Department, cabinet agency in the federal government. The federal CIO, who is the U.S. government CIO, came to me and like, hey, you got some time between uh, 7 at night and, you know, morning to work on another project. Uh, we need to get this thing. The president signed this in the bill. We want to get this out. We got data.gov up in three to six months. That's amazing for federal government uh, with all the security and everything else. This is the web website I was talking about. This is the one on the right, data.hawaii.gov, where our governor is a big supporter also of this open and openness and transparency and put that out there. But even if it's open or closed, guess what we need to do with data? Visualize, socialize, mobilize, analyze information. That's what we need. If you can do that on anything that you do, open or closed, that's what we need to do. So today, we have an incredible set of panelists. And these panelists will tell you what they can do with data, both open and closed. But it's all about information sharing and governance. So first off, I'm going to introduce Blake Oshiro. He's the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Governor and basically runs the show. So, Blake. Okay, thanks, Annie. I don't know if I'm incredible or actually run the show, but thank you anyway for that introduction. Um, so I'm Blake. I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Governor. And so what I do is I primarily help the Governor in his <coughs> policy development and the budget when it comes to putting it all together. And so really what we're talking about when we talk about data and why we're doing this is, you know, the governor has always looked at data as the real means by which we need to be making policy and by which we need to be making decisions. And what he wants to have is data-driven decision-making. And so that was sort of the directive that he sent down. And so what we're trying to do when it comes to data is a few things. We're mostly trying to use it as a communications tool because I think people have a sense that our departments and our agencies are out there in the slog, they're working really hard, they're in the trenches, they're doing the good work on behalf of the state of Hawaii, but the story doesn't oftentimes get out in terms of how they're actually helping to move the ball forward and improving people's lives. And so that's one of the main things that we're hoping we can accomplish with the data is trying to tell that important story. Because ultimately if people have a connection to their government, then at that point they have a participation and an investment in it. And so that's one of the first goals when it comes to data. Um, the second thing that we're trying to do is actually trying to use data so we can have real knowledgeable decision-making process. Of course, when it comes to government, when it comes to the political process that is oftentimes in elective office, there are other factors at play. I'm not going to say that it's exclusively only going to be data-driven, but we, what we want to have is data at the core. So that, that is actually the foundation by which it's driving a lot of the decisions. And so what we really need to do is take a look at not only where areas where we're accomplishing things, but what are the areas that we actually might need improvement. And so that's where we're actually going to be looking at data is where are we actually just kind of holding the status quo or where actually are things going on a downward trend that we actually should be improving. And so that is sort of the overall driving forces when it comes to data. 
So where do you start? Um, so like I said, this is really something that started at the governor's office. He made this a directive, he made it an important priority, and he made it something that he wanted me to help get pushed down through all of the agencies. And so I really got to commend all of the departments and the agencies for stepping forward because they already have so much that they're doing. They're already working really, really hard doing the day-to-day -day operations that's necessary, but we asked them to do a little bit more. We asked them to take on this project so that we can start putting some transparency in government and trying to make people understand the stories that are going on. And so like Sunny had already referenced, um, this past year the legislature passed and the governor signed Act 263, um, which actually will require us to start moving towards this open data initiative. And so now it's going to be the law and now it's something that we definitely have to do and it is something that the governor definitely supports. Now when it comes to the issue of data, there's always a question of who owns the data. And I think what we've always told the departments and the agencies is they are going to be the owners of it. It is not something that we are going to try and take from them and we're going to try and spin it a certain way or try and make it something that it's not. The data is the data and the only way that it maintains its credibility is it has to maintain its accuracy. And so that to us is an important factor so that we make sure it's owned by the agencies and they're the ones that are going to be controlling it. Um, so what we're going to be doing when it comes to the data is we're going to try and see to what extent we can have even departments working with other departments. Because oftentimes what we found is um, Department of Human Services has some great statistics on their um, Medicaid program, um, but oftentimes that stuff doesn't necessarily get translated to the Department of Health or vice versa. And so we want to try and make sure that we have this open communication going on so that we can always be moving the ball forward. The next thing is how do you keep it secure? So, you know, one of the things that we did was I completely recognize that I'm not the data expert. I will fully admit that I am not a techie guy. Even this MacBook Air thing is kind of confusing <laughs> me because I'm, I mean, not that I'm showing the preference, but I'm used to my regular laptop and the mouse and all that stuff. Um, so I fully admit I'm not the data guy. And so what we did was we formulated the data council. And so each of the departments and the agencies have appointed a particular person to participate on this council. And that person person is actually going to be the one that sort of drives what are the policies when it comes to defining the standards, to defining who's going to be controlling it, what are the prioritizations of the data, what kind of policies do we need when there are certain things that need to be protected, like Sunny had uh, referenced, when there's things that we can't be putting out in public, but actually more importantly, how are we integrating all of the departments together? Because as you'll see when Beth um, goes forward, there's going to be some areas where actually some of the goals that we're putting forth are multi-departmental. And so we need to make sure that our departments are coordinating and collaborating when it comes to the data. So uh, what standards should be used? Our general standard is open is the default. What we want to say is look at the data and we want to make it available to the extent that it's possible. As long as it's something that we can disclose, that's going to be our goal is to try and disclose it because ultimately, like I said, it's the law. Secondly, it's something that the governor really, really believes in. But third, we want to see and have a real engagement with the public and with the departments so that we can start using the data to, to start moving this all forward. The last thing that I wanted to talk about was the timeline. And so this is just kind of a general sketch of what you can see we've been doing so far. So we've been working on this after the bill was signed in about mid-July. We started putting together all of these pieces and we started having multiple meetings so we can make sure that our data council is actively engaged, actively moving forward and really taking this on. And I think what you'll see with Beth's presentation is we're gonna give you some demos of some of the things that we've already prepared. Um, so today is actually the first time that we're actually going to show it publicly. We're not quite officially ready to launch on all the data sets yet, but it is something that we hope to do very, very soon because it is something that we really, really want to get out to the public so that we can demonstrate all of these great stories that our departments are doing. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you, Blake. Uh, I wanted to introduce Beth Blower. Uh, before I do that, just want to also recognize Cheryl Kakus Park in, right there. She's in the Lieutenant Governor's office, and she's really also a key player in this whole, uh, and was really responsible for helping us with this whole open data bill. And also the Uniform Information Practices Act, got to put that in there. So with that, I want to introduce Beth Blower. She's the former Chief Operating Officer for the State of Maryland, working for Governor O'Malley, and was one of the key people who really put out state stat which is, in my view, the best uh, uh, dashboard in the country. So, uh, until Hawaii, of course. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a very tall order to come to that level, but she is amazing. And I think uh, Blake and, uh, and uh, Beth will talk a little bit about this dashboard that we're aspiring towards. Uh, you know, so Beth, with that, she's the director of GovStat, currently at Socrata, and the company that does open data. So please give a warm welcome to Beth Lau. Thanks, everyone, and um, uh, thanks for having me. Um, hope I've met many of you um, over the last several months that I've been here on the ground doing work. Um, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of why it is that we're doing this, and I want to answer those sort of same four fundamental questions that Sunny asked us to um, answer more through my context of the work that I was doing in the state of Maryland to give you some of the, my experience more to sort of position my credibility around why it is that I'm here, why I'm engaging with you, uh, why I'm nagging some of you and hassling you for data and information. Um, but before I get started, actually, there are two empty seats up here. So if there's anyone against the wall who wants to sit down, there are seats and please come to, come in um, so you can uh, be comfortable. Uh, hopefully I won't be too boring, but if you're standing up, I can imagine it might be a struggle. Um, so I'm talking a little bit about sort of this era of the shift from data-driven government. I think a lot of times when people talk about open data, sort of the default response is we're opening our data to making it public. But one of the things that I focused on in my work in Maryland that I'm focusing on here in my work in Hawaii is to think about the idea of opening data so that you can share amongst yourselves at government agencies. And so what we're trying to do is establish a platform where the first sort of um, draft of your um, path to open data is releasing that data and getting it sort of socialized amongst yourselves at government agencies. And this is going to help you as you're thinking about um, decision making. So we're using data in a much more robust way already in the state. Um, and we're trying to evolve into, an, uh, um, um, into a model where we can take data and start using it for decision making from a policy perspective, from a legislative perspective, from an operational perspective on the day to day, so that you start to think about more deliberately, particularly as we sort of emerge out of the recession into the new economy, how can we better leverage this asset, this data, so that we can make decisions in a way that's more responsible, so that we can be held accountable in a real way to our stakeholders, ultimately citizens of the state. And so the questions that Sunny asked are the right questions, right? This is how do you get started and what do you do and, and, and how should you drive it? The, the hardest part about any kind of data-driven approach in government is actually just getting started. Um, and I think that sometimes it's like ripping the Band-Aid off, right? And, and people are a little bit, um, they have a lot of like anxiety about their data. We have sort of a spectrum of data owners and that we've seen here even on the ground where we've got sort of data hoarders who sit and, you know, they don't want to share their data. And then we've got people who are kind of over sharers of data, right? Like really want their data to be, and we have to find kind of that balance and making sure, but getting started always seems to be the hardest part. Um, but. The, the idea and, and what should give comfort to those of you who are working in agencies who are very um, entrenched in, the, in, in your world of both collecting and curating data is that you should always maintain control of your data. You are the best shepherds of your metadata. You describe your data in the best way. If, you, if we try to relinquish control of data from the data owners themselves, then all we're doing is sort of shooting ourselves in the feet. So you absolutely should be, uh, remain data owners. And then how do you keep it secure? You ask questions. You start to really think about sort of the boundaries of the data. In Maryland, we spent an enormous amount of time talking about data. And those discussions about data, they helped us make some really important decisions around how we keep our citizens safe, what decisions we are making around housing for our citizens and the environment. And I'm gonna actually talk a little bit more about that later. And then what standards should be used? The, the most important thing about standardization, particularly when you're thinking about metadata and sort of how to store your data and think about your data is that it's consistent that you shouldn't be creating 
standards for your data in the same silos that exist within your agencies. But you should be thinking about it more from the enterprise so that when any user of data from the state or consumer of data from the state can look at the metadata, can look at the descriptors of that data, and then they can say, they have an initial reaction that, oh, this is the Hawaii standard for data. It's consistent with national best practices. It's consistent with state best practices, but it's acknowledged that it's across the enterprise. I wanted to show you just a quick video, and I was telling um, Blake earlier, it's a little Martin O'Malley, so excuse us, it's where I come from, but it does give a little bit of background about sort of what I was doing and where I came from, and I think it might help sort of contextualize the, the rest of our session. Just a couple of minutes, so bear with me. And oh, oh now we're still, uh-oh, hold on. We still are an ACDC for you. Funny. <laughs> All right, hold on one second, let me get out of that. Unless you want to just uh, listen to ACDC. All right, sorry. For many in the city back again. then, a cauldron of crime, drugs, and profound despair. All right. I copy shots fired. Off of mission just south of the off ramp of the 15th. It's hard to know where dreams end, but we know where this one began. Baltimore in the late 1990s. For many in the city back then, a cauldron of crime, drugs, and profound despair. So one city councilman ran for mayor by walking its mean streets. Maybe it was right here at the intersection of Park Heights and Belvedere where the intersection between what was and what could be took hold. Assaulted by batteries and bottles hurled by drug dealers angered at having their business interrupted, Martin O'Malley formulated an assault on hopelessness. He didn't make a campaign promise to make the city safer. He made a pledge, and he kept it. Mayor O'Malley implemented a data-driven initiative called CityStat, because you need to know where the problem is before you can fix it. And things that get measured are things that get done. After two terms, crime was driven down. The greatest 10-year reduction in any major U.S. city. Drug overdoses were driven down. Racial tension was down, and for most families in the city, things were finally looking up. And this belief began formulating inside Mayor O'Malley. If it was possible to turn things around in Maryland's most troubled city, why not Maryland itself? A state that had a $1.7 billion structural deficit and some severely underperforming schools. If CityStat helped O'Malley change a city, couldn't StateStat help change a state? Because each statistic told a story about a child needing a better education, a new father needing a job, a state worker needing pension security, and a community needing neighborhood security. <clears throat> and in 2007, Mayor O'Malley became Governor O'Malley. And things that were measured did get done. And the things that got done got measured. Maryland became number one in education five years in a row, number one in holding down the cost of college tuition, Number one in innovation and entrepreneurship. Number one in research and development. Number one in median family income, with a certain public official named number one in the nation. And as state stat was transforming a state, Bay stat was transforming the Chesapeake Bay, halting decades of decline from pollution, sewage, and runoff, and making it a healthier place for blue crabs, oysters, and the numerous fishermen, restaurants, and people that depend on them. Because O'Malley believes in the dignity of every individual, he transformed a few other things, allowing two people who happen to be the same sex to join in the same union everyone else can, and giving new Americans a chance to dream the same dreams as every American by giving them the opportunity for a college education. And while he was cutting statewide pollution, crime, and illegal guns, he was cutting the cost of statewide government because sometimes you need to prune in the present to foster growth in the future. Way back when, Martin O'Malley forged a belief while walking the streets of Baltimore, and a belief that changed a city, changed a state, and changed more than a few lives along the way. So that is a really great description of the, oh, sorry, of the work that I was doing in Maryland. I was the director of state stat in the governor's delivery unit, and I was responsible for overseeing that data-driven approach. 
um, to land some of those number one um, designations. And Sonny has, in turn, um, has uh, hired me to get some of those number ones from Maryland here in the state of Hawaii. And so we're working together with Blake to, to accomplish that. Um, but I wanted to just to show that video to sort of give you the context of that, the idea of this, that sort of sometimes when we think about data, we think about data in a really binary way. And it really is this application of the use of data that can drive decision making, that can dramatically improve the way that we interact with our citizens, that we deliver our services, and that we drive outcomes. And I think that that's really important when we think about the types of things that we can do together and when we start to de-silo government and think about this data-driven approach. So this is a little bit of just a slide that kind of talks about the history of sort of what we did in Maryland, sort of borrowing the STAT idea from CompStat, which was implemented in New York City, through um, what we did at the city level in Baltimore, grew and growing it up to the state level, and then now we're working with a lot of states and cities that are thinking about this paradigm shift from going from sort of leading by gut feelings and intuition, but actually leading by evidence and making decisions based in data. I did want to take you through sort of a quick example of how we did that to kind of help you visualize how we use data in the state of Maryland to drive decision making. Um, and this is just an example. This was the room I worked in for the last six years where I sat and I led conversations with cabinet secretaries six to, time, six to eight times a week that were based in data. We used data. We depicted it on the walls of our room. And we had a conversation about how we could drive income, uh, how we could drive um, uh, the indicators in the right direction. And, and this, is a, this particular one is a picture of our base stat team. We brought stakeholders from both inside of government and outside of government. We got them to agree on the data, the sort of playing field that we would use. And we started talking about it. But the example I did want to walk through today was um, the example of ending childhood hunger. The governor had a goal of ending childhood hunger in our state. Childhood hunger is something really hard to, to measure. There is no childhood hunger index. There is no overarching data that you can look at. And so what we set out to do is we set out to have a conversation with stakeholders across the state who were really close to the issue of, of childhood hunger. And they told us that if we could get every child who was eligible for a free or reduced lunch to get a free or reduced breakfast, a meal in the evening, and fed in the summertime, that we would do a really good job at making sure that we were taking a chunk out of childhood hunger. And they also said that those same kids are all eligible for the supplemental food program through the federal government, and only a very small percentage of their families are receiving the SNAP benefits. So they said if we could get all of those students to be getting their meals at school and get their families enrolled in SNAP, that that would be for them an indication that we had ended childhood hunger in the state and so that's what we started out to do and so one of the first things that we realized was that we had a lot of children participating in school lunch the data was telling us that over 85 percent of the children eligible were actually getting lunch but a very small fraction of those children were getting breakfast even though they were entitled to it and was available in their schools and the reason why was because in order to get breakfast, they had to go into the cafeteria when they got off the school bus, when all the other students got to go right to their classrooms or got to go and hang out in the hallways. And there was a stigma attached to eating breakfast in our schools. And it wasn't working for kids to have to go and be singled out and sent into the cafeteria. And so what we decided to do was we decided to start giving kids who are eligible breakfast on the school bus on their way to school. Or we started giving them breakfast in their classrooms. And their teachers knew um, the children that were eligible. And they were able to give them what looked like a Lunchable so they could eat their breakfast at their desk. There was no stigma. And we started to demystify the idea that breakfast meant that you're needy in our schools. And it meant that we were just trying to prepare our students for academic success. And so we started to see a huge uptake in penetration increases in our ability to feed children breakfast. And then we started to think about after school programming and why we weren't sending children home with an evening meal before they left our schools, particularly in the most vulnerable areas around our state. So we used the map and we plotted out where we had the biggest amount of children in need. And then we decided to start funding them with a public private partnerships, evening meals. And we started to see children that were getting better night's sleep, coming to school ready to learn, coming to school more often because they knew that they were going to get their meals. And then in the summertime, we realized that a huge number of our children were getting meals all school year long, and then they were going home for summer, and the anxiety of summer started setting in as soon as the school year started to end. And we saw the children thinking about how they were going to get fed in summer programs that didn't exist in a lot of our schools during the economic recession. 
So I live in Baltimore City and I see it all over here in Honolulu, the proliferation of food trucks. All the hipsters are going out to get their bentos in the food truck, right? And so what we decided to do, we started to repurpose some of those food trucks and move them all around to our neighborhoods where we knew we had concentrations of children that were hungry. And we started to provide summer meals and programming from food trucks. And the food truck operators um, worked with um, our community churches and synagogues, and they worked to start to distribute food to our kids all summer long. We got kids enrolled in programs, and we did this all using data in a really agile way. We s decided where to focus these efforts using maps and charts and graphs that led us to these decisions. And the results were astounding. We had a huge increase in the number of children participating in our feeding programs, but one of the things we didn't think that we would see so dramatically and so quickly were academic results. Children who are fed, children who want to be in school, they're also ready to learn, and they actually learn. We saw enormous improvements in our school and academic performances. We went from being one of the most struggling school systems in Baltimore City to one of the nation's leading. And we saw um, our test scores dramatically increase in the state. And those are the types of things that you can do with data. And it's not just data from our schools. Data for that project in particular was pulled from our Department of Agriculture. It was pulled from our Department of Education. It was pulled from our Department of Health and Human Services. We took public safety data. We took our road data from our 911 operators. We pulled data from across the state in order to get our children eating food in the state of Maryland. And that's the type of thing that you have to be able to do. You need to have an agility and a platform, a common platform, that you can look at your data and you can start using your data to align it to some of your state's hardest problems. And that's what we're doing here in the state of Hawaii. So for the last year, I've been working with many of you to start getting and freeing that data so we can start to create this platform, so we can start aligning it to some of your problems. And what I'm going to do now is show you kind of where we are. We've trained over 100 people in the state of Hawaii to use the tools um, both on the, for the open data portal and also for GovStat, which is the um, which is the platform that we're using for the New Day dashboard in the governor's office. Um, I have to pull up this one dashboard, which um, was made in our test, uh, in, our, in our training this week, because it is pretty awesome. Um, this person who um, architected this goal will go unnamed, but I will say that they are measuring their awesomeness by Oz. Um, the tools that are available to you um, are available to you not only for the New Day dashboard that the governor is using, but also so that you can demonstrate your awesomeness and measure whatever data you have and track it internally to you. Um, but in all seriousness, um, we're doing a lot of great work, and so actually I'm going to start from here. There's a few of these. are. This is the dashboard, um, and I'm actually going to start here. So you can see um, the way that we're taking the data is where this is, everything that you see here is um, being stored of sort of on the Socrata platform. This is an in, totally internal dashboard right now that we're just using um, to get started. And the idea is that we're going to be freeing a lot of data, getting it onto the platform, and then eventually when the governor's comfortable with it, when the agency's comfortable with it, there may be portions or aspects of this that do re get released to the public. But the idea is that we're going to use it first to solve some of our problems. And so you can see the types of information that are getting onto the dashboard. Um, you can see some of the data we're pulling is being pulled from multiple sources, and many of you probably have seen this in some form or format um, up until today. Oops, I'm going to turn that off. Sorry. Um, all right. And so I wanted to show you a couple of examples. So um, the Department of Energy is actually doing an incredible job. They are using a lot of data, both on their own website, um, this is actually DBET, ener the energy sort of um, agency that sits within DBET. Um, but they're using a lot of data from the open data portal. They're using it in, the, in their own day-to-day -day work. And then they're also publishing that data out onto websites um, and embedding it. But they're also tracking some of their performance. And so one of the things that we talk about is how we're making goals. And so this is a goal where they've decided they want to um, measure energy consumption by the, the portfolio, their energy efficiency portfolio. You can see they're on track to their goal. You can see that the dashboard is allowing you to get some access to some additional information about the strategies that they're employing to get to their goal. This is an area where you could also talk a little bit about what some maybe linking it to some programs if you wanted people to be able to enroll in programs. And then you can see the data is telling them, um, and this is all explorable data, how um, they're doing. And so you can see the Energy Star buildings over time. You can see the number of buildings um, that are LEED certified. And you can see the agency consumption leading by example in the state agencies. 
And then there's also this one, and I'm going to, because in, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the third one I was going to do. Okay. But I wanted to call Blake up because he's going to walk you through this example. Okay, uh, so really quickly, what this one is about is the inmates that are serving on the mainland. And so one of the things that the governor um, indicated when he promised to get um, elected was he wanted to try and bring home as many of these prisoners as possible. And so what you have currently is you have 2,000 people um, when he took office that were on the mainland in detention. But as you can see over time, what we've done is we brought it down to 1,400. So we definitely are trending in the right direction. But what you all will also see is, you know, we take a look at some of the data that's uh, really behind this. And so while the operating expenses have pretty much remained flat, at least we can demonstrate that we are investing in the infrastructure because we're putting in the capital appropriations. And this is really important because what you'll see down there is each of the facilities. And when you see the design in the green versus the actual capacity in the orange, you can see that we're just way maxed out on capacity. And so the only way in which we'll be able to achieve that goal of bringing people home is we're going to have to increase the capacity. There's just no other way to do it. We're going to have to have have more bed space. And so when you take a look at these three drivers, what you can see is it's not the operational money that's being the, the question, that's still maintaining itself. We are increasing more in terms of capital expenditures, but if we really are going to be committed to bringing these other 1,400 people home, the only way we're going to be able to do it is to make sure that we have more bed space. And so this is just a great example of how we're using data so that next session we can go forward with a plan to actually have that in increased capacity. Um, so we're using the data to actually be a policy-driven decision-making. So I, I'm around. I have, a, um, I'm just going to put the PowerPoint slides back up, Sunny, um, and available for you. And, uh, and also Karen Higa from OIMT is here, and she is sort of leading the charge from that perspective. And um, we are here for you. So um, if you have any questions, we'll be around. Thank you. It's really amazing once you see what's coming next. But uh, like I said, we have the dashboard, but Blake is going to make sure it's all, you know, looking clean, everything else, and then maybe after Christmas. Or, or <laughs> <laughs> and I'll leave it up to Blake, but a uh, lot of progress. But as I was saying, you know, it, this is uh, Hawaii's data, and we're going to put it out there. But you can suddenly see that you can visualize, mobilize, and make this information. Wow, I didn't know this was linked together. Anyway, now we have Dr. Christina Teidman from the uh, Department of Education. And education, as you know, recently has announced some amazing things for Hawaii. So, uh, Christina? So at this point, some of you may be thinking, uh, okay, I'm on the open road. I see the vision, I'm heading that way, but I'm really apprehensive that if I turn around, nobody from my office or my, business, my agency will be behind me, right? So part of what I'm going to be doing is sharing with you the Department of Education's um, journey, looking at data governance and how to build in some of these structures. So it's going to be a little bit different pace than what you've heard already. So data governance, as by the Data Governance Institute, is basically setting down the rules of play, the game. So who does what, when can information be released, under what conditions, what parameters, who does the releasing. Because, for instance, with the Department of Education, it's an enormous agency. We have lots of people and lots of different silos. And what may be happening in one silo may conflict with what's happening in another silo. Probably all of you have experienced in your own agencies, depending on who you talk to, you get a different answer. So data governance is about how do we get the same answers for anything related to the data within our system. And basically what we find is that just because we have the same employer doesn't mean we're speaking the same language. Particularly in education, we have the IT language and we have the program language. And they may sit in the meeting, have the same discussion, all agree at the end what's going to happen, and come away with completely different ideas or steps of action because they're seeing it from very different perspectives. So part of what data governance does is bring that together and translate from geek to program, program to geek. 
<laughs> and we're all geeks in the yes. long run, so geek is a good thing in my world. <laughs> so one of the things that we, needed, we knew we needed to do was to establish a formal structure for data governance. We had many people who were doing many different roles, and we um, decided we needed to define what those roles would be. So in our data governance structure, we have three basic levels. We have what we call data investors, who are the everyday people working with the data, handling it. Could be anybody, but these are the ones who generally escalate an issue. They'll say, something's not working here. We need a problem. We're trying to get an answer. We can't get an answer. Can we help with this? So once a problem is escalated and the data investors work together in a subcommittee, so we create a subcommittee on an issue, we come up with a proposal that goes to our data stewards who are individuals who are responsible for data categories. So they're basically the ones who have to answer for the data. If it ends up in the star advertiser and somebody has to answer the questions, it's one of the data stewards who would be feeding the information or interpreting the information. So the data stewards are the ones who decide, who give the um, final clearance about a proposal as to whether that resolution will work for their data and how it, their data interact. One of the challenges has been that uh, before we established our data governance structure, it was program viewed IT as the decision makers about data. And IT viewed program as the decision makers about data. So basically, no decisions were being made because each was looking at the other side saying it's their decision to make. So um, as we've done this, we've had to restructure how we think about data. So data by categories. So for education, it could be enrollment or assessment or discipline. Those are categories, not by system, not whether it's in our student information system or our um, case management system or our food services system, but more by the category of data rather than who owns the system. Um, once an issue goes past the data stewards, it goes up to the final level, which is our data executive committee, and that group depends on um, what the issue is. Sometimes it includes our deputy AG, uh, charter schools are often represented, um, and the leadership, executive leadership, because we still are a traditional organization who likes to be able to say the leader has approved it and therefore we will all follow. So it removes some of that angst about, well, who exactly made this decision? So by building that structure and defining it, it has helped us um, move forward. The next piece was that we created the flow, and the flow that I uh, did the overview for, we have in writing, and it's a living document. We've had to overhaul this a couple times when we found that it didn't work. But the idea is how can we move the process in a predictable and uh, conscientious way so that it continues, that nothing falls between the cracks. We don't get partway through the process and then everybody gets too busy and we never get back to it. So how can we create the document? Do people know what the timelines are for response? What's reasonable timelines for response? And um, what's problematic? So if something isn't working for the data stewards and for the agency, then it's not working for <coughs> data governance. One of the key pieces, talking points, as we went forth was that my office, the data governance office, runs this, but we don't own it. It really is owned by the department, and the data stewards and all the participants need to let us know if something isn't working so that we can then revise the process to make it work. Because if we hold on to a process that is not meaningful or not successful for the users, then we don't really have a viable process. So this is just the first page of about a five-page document that outlines our steps. We also define the roles and responsibilities. As I mentioned, a number of um, individuals play multiple roles, and sometimes they're uh, investors. They're somebody who's bringing an issue up for attention. At other times, they're a data steward. And we needed to clarify when they put on their investor hat and when they put on their data steward hat, because that would depend on the types of feedback that they would give or the types of action that were expected of them. We also wanted to clarify what kinds of time commitments were responsible. 
and who was making which decisions at which points. So all of those are defined. And we have these four basic areas, which are our investors, our stewards, our executive committee, and then the data governance office. Because we really wanted to show that the data governance office will do the organizing of the meetings, will send out the notices, but we're not really the decision makers. The decision makers are the data stewards and the executive committee. From that, we, we decided we needed to have a place to organize the information. We, wanted, we didn't want people to have to search for things because that would decrease the efficiency of the process and also it would tend to um, make it more difficult for people to engage in what was happening. So we made a one-stop shop. This is built on a SharePoint platform. It, we try and keep all of the information that any data steward or data investor or, or the executive committee would need in this site. So we have the, the status of what an issue is. We have opportunities for issues to be escalated on the website. We have our work group spaces, so anybody who's on a subcommittee can go into the work group and they have common collaborative documents that they can work on there. Anybody who's not on a subcommittee but who is tracking the process of that issue because it might affect them but they aren't committed to being on the subcommittee, they can look at the documents as well. They can't edit them, but they can certainly look at them because we're trying to make it as transparent as possible. And then as those subcommittees uh, per set forth proposals and the proposals are adopted, then we close and resolve those issues. And, then, and only the key documents remain in, the, in that place. So if later we have a question about what were we doing for teacher of record, we can go back to that source. Anybody can go back to the final documents and see exactly what was decided upon what date and by whom and the discussion related to it. In some cases we have to reopen up those data issues and they come up for more discussion as well. And then we have other resources um, and uh, key pieces like links to our change control board and our technical architecture review committee. But the idea is it's a one-stop shop so they don't have to be searching for where information is. Then the, uh, as far as our key accomplishments, what we were looking at here is we were able to identify who the owners are. So by establishing the data stewards and defining that it is the category of data that they're working with, not the technology system, that changed def um, the perspective of who were the owners and who would do the releasing. It also, one of the common comments that I hear is, it gave us a place for problems to go. So by having data governance and a data issues resolution process, we could bring our issues to a single place where we knew it would be attended to until it was resolved. And that was particularly important for issues that crossed offices or crossed areas of responsibility because of that, oh, I think it's their job, no, I think it's their job. We were able to bring it together and reach a, a resolution that met both sides' needs. And then we could set that aside and move on to other pieces. So that's been very important for us. And the third piece is the documentation. By establishing this, we always have the documentation. We have a standard documentation that anybody can go back to, so it's not comparing what I have in my files against what you have in your files, which might be a different date and a different version and a different um, document. So this is, has become very important for keeping our process moving forward. So our lessons learned. One is patience and persistence. If you're trying to change Practice, the human element is one of the biggest challenges, so be patient and be persistent. Keep that vision of your open road and slowly people will be joining behind you and you will find eventually when you turn around that there are a lot of people there and some of them are side by side with you and some may be creeping ahead of you. Um, the second one is revisit your process because they are living processes. They need to be responsive to the changing needs of the agencies and the, and the individuals within that. And along with that is the flexibility to do that. The fourth one is communication, which has been enormously important. And that was part of our developing the website because there was a sense that things weren't as transparent as they needed to be. Decisions were being made and others were saying, well, I didn't hear anything about that or I had no idea. Being transparent with the communication, sending information out, pushing it out to people rather than sitting back and saying, well, if you're interested, you'll find it. 
Um, that has been key to moving this process forward. And then finally, training, 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 training. You cannot do enough training to move the process. And as things change, we need to keep training. We identify new groups who need more information about the process. And we know that that will continue as we move into the, the open data aspect. So if, you are, if this is interesting to you at all, there are, we do have a data governance website, a public website, where you can get most of the documents that I've posted up here or shown you, um, also available through the Department of Education. You can contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Doctor. I think uh, uh, what, I, what I know is uh, Hawaii is making some tremendous progress in education, and so keep watching it out that the scores are improving. Now it's my turn to, uh, uh, to uh, introduce uh, Jesse Suki, the Director of Office of Planning, and he will tell us some of the amazing things that are going on in his office and how we can solve this problem with data governance. So, Jesse. Please welcome Jesse. All right. Okay, I'm Jesse Suki. I'm the director of the State Office of Planning. Uh, the State Office of Planning is the institutionalized planning uh, office for the, for the state. Um, the great thing about all this discussion is that the kind of work that we do with the Office of Planning is, relies very heavily on data and cooperation. Uh, planning alone doesn't get you anywhere. It's how you implement those plans that really make the difference, and data is the thing that gets you going for developing plans that are be able to be actionable. Um, in 2011, when I uh, first started with the Office of Planning, um, one thing that we uh, looked at off, off the bat was how can we help the administration improve governance. And so we got the help of Smart Growth America to come in and do a workshop with the cabinet and the governor to look at some um, things that we could do. And one of the things on uh, the recommendation in the final report was state stat. So I'm very happy to see that we've moved so far with uh, state stat, um, which is really um, something that supports what Hawaii statewide planning system is all about, which is functional areas focusing on those functional areas like transportation um, and coordinating how we deal with those functional areas rather than looking at it in silos. So the approach isn't how many roads do we pave, but how do we do what we do in the area of transportation to improve people's lives? And the connections between transportation that you might not see without the data and the kind of things that um, state stat can show us, like housing, affordable housing is connected to how we develop transportation. Investments in transportation develop where we grow and how we grow. Um, investments in transportation um, can make us a healthier society by looking at and integrating other modes of transportation. And all of those types of decisions across agency, across disciplines, and having this data available is, is very exciting and it's going to help us uh, make better decisions in the future for the people of Hawaii. And with that said, now I'm going to talk about talk from prepared notes because the, our office has several programs and one of those programs is the GIS, uh, statewide GIS program. And Joan De Los Santos, um, if, if you know her, um, if you have done anything with state GIS, you, you probably have met her. She's our manager um, in that program, and she prepared notes for me because I don't want to miss anything. So here we go. The Office of Planning is at the forefront of open data and transparent government in Hawaii, in particular the GIS Modernization Project, which is a joint project with OIMT, and the Office of Planning is a prime example of using modern technology to implement open data concepts in state government. So again, I'll just be focusing on the GIS modernization portion of the whole ITS plan. Uh, and what we're looking at is delivering data to government and citizens in a variety of ways through download, REST services, and cloud mapping that I'll talk about later on. Um, currently, we've published as much information as we are legally permitted to release. And this discussion is apropos. This morning in um, the advertiser, there was an editorial about open data. And, uh, uh, the writer of that editorial yeah. talked talk about um, uh, reference President Obama's open data, you know, the presumption that things are open, all data is open. Um, so, uh, you know, my office, we try to put everything online, but it's not that easy, right? That's oversimplifying. So, for example, we deal primarily in land use and planning. Um, do you want the world to know exactly where sensitive Native Hawaiian burials are? So you need to have some kind of governance for dealing with that kind of information. 
Um, we are um, looking at how can we plan for coastal uses and the community groups that we are involved with to tell us these are the great surf spots, you know, and you identify that in a spatial format so that you know how to plan around the area. Uh, they might not want that information to be public. So dealing with those kind of challenges. Um, so there's the want and presumption to make data open and available, but then there's also those, those other complicated issues that you have to deal with aside from statutory privacy requirements and such. <coughs> So Office of Planning uses its website to make data available to decision makers and the public to communicate progress of programs and missions. And this is something that all of the state agencies actually have been doing as well. Um, we improve the website to make it user friendly so that information is easy to find uh, and easily accessible. And this slide here shows some of the information that's available on our site and also the initiative that we're working on um, using GIS data and state, county, and federal government coordination and coordination with the public to have spatial information in a tool available for making decisions about specific types of public trust permitting that the state's involved with. Um, we're looking at um, lining up this spatial information with special management area permit um, criteria and other types of uh, permitting in the public trust coastal area that rely heavily on data. And our goal really is to have both the policymakers, well, it's more than both, have policymakers, regulators, the regulated, and the public all working from the same base level of information when these um, decisions are being made. So our state GIS program has a long history of sharing data and open to the public. We've been doing it for about 20 years. We have about 200 uh, data layers that we maintain on the state GIS file server, which is housed and maintained by ICSD, uh, most of which we make available for download to the public. Um, this is a great and um, well-used resource, and you know how we know that is because um, the server went down once and Joan had to field dozens and dozens of phone calls about <laughs> what happened to the information. But, so, so that was positive because we knew people were using the resource. But on the downside, and we hope to improve on this, is that people found the system then unreliable. And so there was duplication of data by keeping data in-house in and then less sharing um, uh, since that event. But it's, it's become better and you know, the information is still there. So check out our website, planning.hawaii.gov. So, the exciting thing is that um, we'd like to expand on the foundation of the data and sharing that we've been doing. And in 2012, when Sonny came on board, he set out to transform IT and state government, as you know, which includes GIS as a component of that. Um, what do you call it, Sonny? You call it the um, GIS is the, what kind of app? It doesn't, well, it's a killer app. The killer app. The GIS <laughs> is the killer app. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With Aloha. <I> mean. <laughs> so, um, uh, Sunny and his group, along with Office of Planning, convened GIS uh, working group of stakeholders, uh, mostly state agency GIS, but also we reached out to the Hawaii Geographic Information <coughs> Coordinating Council, um, which is made up of county, state, federal, um, and the private sector, so that we could get everybody's input around the table. Uh, the group held several working meetings um, through January and May 2012, and they came up with a 10-year modernization plan for uh, GIS. Um, and as a statewide planning office, coordination and cooperation is vital to the work we do, so it was important that we reached out and got, uh, made a collaborative effort. So Im implementation of the 10-year uh, plan is well on its way. The plan's vision is for, you, you can follow along on this graphic, um, the plan's vision is for one authoritative data repository that will be the source from which a variety of data delivery mechanisms can be drawn upon. This repository would employ common industry standards as well as standards developed and agreed to by the larger GIS community, um, including the Hawaii Geographic Information Coordinating Council, as I had mentioned. One implemented this modernization statewide GIS will help to reduce redundant data sets and will provide better, more reliable information for its users. Um, our office is working with, you know, these are examples of things that we're doing to move the ball forward. Um, so the, one of it is our office is working with the Pacific Disaster Center, who has great expertise and a lot of resources. Um, and they're on Maui, 
um, to provide infrastructure for the state GIS service <coughs> bandwidth and expertise. Um, OP and PDC staff have begun migrating all of our hundreds of data layers into a relational database management system for improved performance. About 80% of the layers we have have been loaded into the database. And PDC continues to work on this, and we are working also on delivering the state's satellite imagery layers um, to that system. We have metadata for all of our data sets. Um, that's something that um, Joan has been good, good at doing. Um, she and uh, Dennis Kim is also in our GIS program. They've, they've always prioritized having metadata so people understand what they're using and where it comes from, the provenance. Um, uh, but what we're also doing with PDC is converting this metadata into a federally compliant metadata standard format. Uh, the federal government came out with some standards uh, that should make uh, metadata uh, more consistent so it's going to be consistent throughout the whole country, which makes sharing and using data um, to mash things up and make decisions even easier. Very powerful. Um, and she wrote here, um, I, I thought this was funny, she says, it makes data more discoverable and metadata <coughs> ingestible. Is that, is that a word, ingest, metadata? You tech guys know what that means? Okay, I don't know. Tasty. Tasty? <laughs> okay. Um, so although the Office of Planning and PDC are managing the data, we consider the data to be owned um, by the originators with statutory jurisdiction. Uh, for example, the reserve areas from DLNR, those layers that we have, the land use districts from the Land Use Commission, those agencies still retain, retain um, statutory responsibility for the accuracy of that data. But by uh, pulling it into one centralized server, it makes it easier for users, decision makers, policy makers to access the data and, and mash it up. Um, the data is delivered through REST services, um, which are pulling directly from the database. Um, once fully implemented, the data will be available across platforms regardless of what GIS software or web API you might be using. Users uh, with desktop GIS will be <coughs> able to access the data through the REST services to do their mapping or modeling as well. Um, always using the best, the most up-to-date data. In some cases, users on the state network will choose to access the data directly from their desktop. However, for many desktop map projects, pulling directly from the live authoritative database will be the preferred method of accessing that data. Um, some other things that are going on, um, OIMT has purchased an annual subscription to ArcGIS Online, a cloud mapping platform for state agency users, maps and applications, made in this environment will also use the authoritative state GIS database through the REST services. Um, there will be no need to make a copy of the data. Um, that, that's a reoccurring theme. You don't want duplicate data across the state in silos. Um, the state GIS program simply registers the REST service in the cloud environment, and when users point to that layer in ArcGIS, the data is pulled from the REST service. Um, the user will be able to search data layers directly in ArcGIS Online, and this will be all transparent to the user, which is good as far as I'm concerned, transparent. And then that's the whole concept, right? To make the tool available to decision makers who don't have a, a, a master's degree in GIS. <laughs> I, know, I know when I first started um, uh, in, at the university, we were just coming out with email, and you know, I was managing a computer lab at the time, you know, it was uh, Windows 3. <laughs> and, uh, you know, GIS was something that was the cool thing, you know, and, and in order to get data out of that system, it was, you know, even though I was pretty good at working with, uh, you know, basic language and networking and all that, I could not wrap my mind around GIS. We've come so far, uh, and, and we want to go further to make it very easy for the people who need, need to make complicated decisions to use GIS because it's a powerful tool. Uh, let's see. Yes, oh, okay. Yes. I'm almost done. Another example um, of a project taking place with respect to both ArcGIS Desktop and ArcGIS Online is OIMT's work on implementing an enterprise license agreement um, with ESRI. This will include deployment of desktop and subscriptions to ArcGIS Online. And these are some. Uh, the location of the um, current data um, that is online. And it, it's an example of how the modernization project 
um, is using uh, modern technology to deliver data to government and citizens in a variety of ways through the REST services and cloud mapping at gishawaii.gov. Upon completion of the GIS modernization, state agency users will find it easier to access the most current correct data. And this is an ArcGIS, and this is what the, something like what the site will look like, and it's up for you to play with now as well. So it, while all this is going on, um, Office of Planning also is um, assisting state agencies in the development of tools that they use. Um, this would include the GIS, uh, where is it? Is it on here? Oh, yeah, EnerGIS. Uh, you know, uh, the GIS program in my office worked with uh, Energy to develop the EnerGIS program, um, which is received very well by the energy community. Um, energy developers um, helped develop the pedestrian accidents um, map for the Department of Health, the vaccination locations and the DLNLR coastal users maps and tools. And that's all I have in the world of GIS. Thank you. All right, thank you. You left me 26 seconds spare to spare. Thank you, Marlo. <laughs> uh, the last presenter is uh, Lauren Kim, and he is from the Department of Health. And we will start the process by going this way. Thank you. Great. Please give a warm welcome. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, it's 11.15, so that's when lunch starts. And what's important to know, aside from the fact that I work at the Department of Health, is that I spent 20 minutes circling the parking lot trying to get in this morning. Mm -hmm. So I missed breakfast. So I'm as interested in getting out of this as quickly as uh, we can, as you are. So I'm going to blast through what was uh, originally constructed as a 10-minute um, presentation. Um, <clears throat> I guess um, I'm going to skip around, so try not to hold me too much to the, um, the slides. I just want to hit my main points in the interest of time. Um, one of the things that I want to discuss today, uh, we were going to go hit the goals one by one, um, is really to, to bring across the point that governance is going to give the Department of Health an opportunity to be more impactful in its interventions. When you're in healthcare and public health, everything you do is an intervention. You're always trying to change knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors, whether it's on a population level and it, or an individual level. And we're embarking on this journey. You know, one of the questions that we were, we were tasked to ask is who should drive it? That's the one slide that I didn't um, populate. Uh, and that's because it's being driven by the leadership of the governor and Blake. They've given us the tools, and I'm really, really grateful that we have this opportunity. They, they, set the, they do what leaders do. They set the expectation that we're going to have this um, opendata.gov, that we're going to have Socrata come in. And it's just been a tremendous um, boost to our organization because we all would have been sitting around you know we have over 3,000 employees 75 programs we have eight major funders who want the data in their way and in their style um, and the fact that some of the metrics that we're being tasked with producing are multi-agency is exactly what this department wants and I'll get to that at the end skip skip um, so we're trying to currently get a grasp we are sort of in the middle of, of the pack um, the DOE I'm just Phenomenal applaud what, what you've done with, with some of your with, with your schema. Um, at a high level, this is what our business model looks like and what supports it. I'm, um, I drill down. We have four administrations: environmental, behavioral, um, health resources, and general administration. So we do a little of everything. We are a provider. We are a payer. We are a population manager. We are a regulator. We are inspectors. Um, this one map is I, I put up. I want to spend a couple seconds on it because it's very pretty. Um, it's just one administration, and this, this really shows you in a visual sense how everything overlaps and connects. Federal agencies, licensings, we have our own GIS, water quality, so on and so forth. And we drill down just, this is one administration, one out of four, in one cabinet agency out of 17, in one branch of government. And th what we're trying to do to make a difference. This, and I'm going to blast these slides, but I want you to... I want you to draw your eyes to the yellow, things that are yellow. Those are standalone data systems or information systems. This is just, this is that same map for um, environmental health. 
This is it for a function within a division. This is what, we, this is what it takes to do disease outbreak surveillance. Going one level down, this is what it takes to deliver a single service to an individual at one of our direct healthcare service centers. And this is something that um, is more, a little more representative of system-wide and that is multi-jurisdictional. Multi this is the emer emergency medical system, county, private, state, all of that. So again, I just want you to kind of get a sense of relative magnitude from the yellow dots. And I'm going to leave off on this one in, into a more specific example, because this is something that touches all our lives, vital records. Very quickly, we are not the NSA, but we do <laughs> kind of see everything that's going on. From before you were born, we have uh, in, in various levels of, of detail and specificity some of the family planning and uh, prenatal health activities. Then you're born, we generate a record. If you're medically fragile and have some of these general childhood issues, childhood immunizations, you have to have one to get into school, we have a record of that. We have a registry for that. If you are a child with maybe that, are, has, that is severely emotionally disturbed, you'll, you will enter our child and adolescent mental health system. And on and on and on, we start calling you to see if you smoke. Um, if you fall off your skateboard, we'll have a record of that and we'll know, just like in Jesse's slide, we know where that would happen, or the corner where that happened. Um, if you uh, get an STD, uh, it happens, um, you can get anonymous <laughs> free services from our clinic. Uh, Hawaii's very good at chlamydia screening, by the way, so that's actually a positive. Um, then we start calling you to see, well, you know, do you exercise, do you um, uh, eat well, do you smoke, how much do you drink, are you a binge drinker? If you do, maybe you need to enter our uh, addiction treatment services. If you traveled somewhere and you bring back a communicable disease, so on and so forth. So, you know, throughout your whole adult lifespan, the Department of Health touches you in some way. And even into the senior years, we're into falls prevention, community paramedicine, senior flu vaccination, extremely important. Then there's a death record, but we're not done with you yet. Because you have a burial permit, a cremation permit, and then we need to make sure that legitimately and appropriately you are taken off the rolls of your insurance plan or your, you know, you're you know, not on voter, voter records or anything like that. All this is happening while we're also trying to protect everything you eat, everything you drink, everything you breathe, everything you ingest, all those tasty data bits, Sonny. <laughs> where, where you're recreating, you want brown water advisories, and everything that you're recycling, your computers, your, your, your bottles, and so on and so forth. Remember, everything we do is an intervention, right? Um, I'll, I'll skip this. I, I do want to spend a little bit of time on who owns the data. Uh, it is an ethical and professional standard in healthcare and public health that for medical records and public health records, you own the data. We are stewards of that data. That is an extremely important concept. None of us can forget, especially when we're talking about governance. It's your data, it's data about you, it's stuff about you, you own it. There are legal interpretations of that and contractual interpretations of that in provider payer relationships, but it's about you. This is the perspective that we're coming from. We take this stuff very, very seriously. There is a reason why Roe versus Wade the legal theory that it, it pivoted around was around privacy, right? It's the, you know, you're the right to have an inter intentional termination of pregnancy or an abortion hinges around one's right to privacy. That is sacrosanct in healthcare and in public health. But we still need the data. You know, why do we need the data and why is governance important? Well, we want to make pretty maps like this. This is LA County. I don't, I'm not gonna tell you what this map is in a bit. Um, this is one thing you do with metadata and big data. This is another map, still LA County. This is another thing that you do with data. You might see if I can get this to work, go back, kind of similar, it's almost the same map. So what do we do with it and why is governance important? Well, on the next slide, <clears throat> you're, you're gonna see that this map, which is the first one I show you, is the economic hardship index, LA County. And on the second map is the, is the incidence, or is the prevalence of childhood obesity. This is an intervention, this is why we need uh, data.gov state stat. It's ju not just telling a story, it's about making a difference. It's about affecting public policy. Social determinants of health, the things that affect, you know, the choices you have. We're, we're totally fine with the line that, you know, some people choose to do this or that. People make choices to eat, drink a lot of soda, eat spam. The choices, <laughs> no, I'm serious. You know, you, we're fine with the fact, with the premise that, you know, it's about personal choice. But the choices you make are the choices you have. If you have nowhere to go to exercise, because you're gonna get shot in the streets, 
If your local convenience store only sells Spam because Spam costs three bucks a can and kale is seven dollars a bunch, you know, those choices have been made for you. And this is why public health and why governance is important. And this is my, my point that I'm trying to make is that governance, the, 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 the journey that we're embarking on, will give this credibility. This is a correlation. This is the least, this is one of the lowest levels of evidence base that you can get. This is pretty much a correlation that's almost regression analysis. Where are all the obese people? Where are the poor people? Hmm, logically, they, they come together. You know, there are various levels, the highest being evidence level 1A, which is double blind randomized clinical trials, so on and so forth. Um, but that's what we're trying to get to. So we are doing data governance. We are doing a good job. If you go to uh, hawaiihealthmatters.org, we have social disparities and community dashboards up and running. The next challenge for us, you can go by county, you can go by disease condition, economic condition, age, education level. These are all interventions. This is an intervention in and of itself that we measure, knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. <clears throat> But what the big promise for us is, is when we see actual, real clinical data come in. And that's, we will be the biggest beneficiaries of that. And by extension, the general public will. And, I, and I'll wrap this up because i got two more slides. The data that I presented that's on Hawaii Health Matters is largely self-report. We call people and we say, how much do you smoke? How much do you weigh? I mean, my license says I'm 150, my driver's license. So we need to get to a point where, and this is happening right now, and hopefully you'll go to the health IT session, where you're going to see that health information exchange, the proliferation of electronic medical records, will allow us to stop calculating disease incidence and prevalence. Am I saying this correctly? To, to, to stop, I'm sorry, instead of estimating disease incidence and prevalence, we will be able to calculate it, actually have denominators you know, um, human beings that will remain anonymous, but in aggregate, we will know, do they have diabetes? And if we can get some of the data that, you know, Jesse's agency helps pull together, the, you know, it, all I need is to know is, is, is how sick are you, where you live, and one piece that would be really helpful to us is how much money you make. Give me these three things, and we can really make an impactful difference <coughs> on public policy. Um, All-payer claims database is coming up. That will marry healthcare data, administrative data, with EMR data, with public health data. Um, and this, I'm gonna bring it home with this point here. All we're trying to do with, and again, we really appreciate the leadership of Blake and the governor, is affect public policy. There's an emerging strategy recognized by the World Health Organization called Health in All Policies. What does this mean? Is that means health policy happens in the Department of Education, in the Department of Taxation, in the Department of Agriculture. All of those folks, their decisions impact the cost of fresh fruits and vegetables, how far you're gonna to drive to work, and the, the stress, the allostatic load that you just get on the freeway, um, you know, taxation for you know, medical services, so on and so forth. That's all gotta to come together. We're just taking the first baby steps in the department to get organized. And the last example I'm gonna give is that we really do a good job with epidemiology. Epidemiology is a credible science, it is an art, it is very rigorous. The department, with the help of, of the governor's office and Socrata, are gonna take it to that next step. I sit in a, I'm gonna wrap this up in 30 seconds, sorry. Every meeting, at one, every Monday at 1.30, there is a department leadership meeting with the deputies, the director, and the staff officers, of which I'm one. And we sit on this wealth of data, but almost never do we have a, a, a chart in front of us with, with a number. And that's what, we're gonna, we're gonna have a little sandbox for the Department of Health with Socrata, and we're gonna bring that into that meeting. Um, and that's where it's going to hit home. We've got all the governance in all these little places. The trick is going to be to bring it together. And the fact that, we are, that many agencies are going to be on the same platform is just, I can't believe my luck that I walked into this. So, I mean, seriously. Um, and to have sit in my boss's meeting where, where they make decisions about what's going to happen that week, to actually have a chart, a data, a bar graph, a pie chart, <clears throat> that's not the usual practice. And, and we're sitting on tons of data. And this is really going to allow us to improve our credibility and really impact public policy. And that's the point I wanted to make. So um, everything that you do, please give it to the Department of Health because we need it. That's health in all policies. <laughs> We're not the NSA. We still want it all. But it's, you know, you know what I mean. So thank you very much. I hope we've got that shot. Thank you. That was a great job. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, and we don't mind giving it to you as long as it's protected, yes? Yeah? So, uh, 
well, a couple of things. First of all, I want to give a shout out also to Bert Lum. Uh, he has been the author of that bill and really one of the forces behind it with open data. So big shout out to you and yourself. <laughs> it's all about the citizens. And I also wanted to recognize uh, we have uh, Karen Higa is in the back. She is uh, our new open program manager, open gov program manager. <laughs> But I also wanted to recognize Deborah Gagne. She was the first open data manager for Hawaii, so thank you very much. And uh, I want to just say, can you give it up for this panel? This panel is just fabulous. Okay, fabulous. Okay. So uh, I'm actually a little bit over time, but if you don't tell anybody, we can take a couple of questions and just keep it to ourselves. What do you say? All right, any questions? Yes, sir. Can you take Yes, all of them will be made available. Okay. Every open, open data. <laughs> <laughs> we will. I will just check with. Uh, we're going to put it on my website for sure at uh, ymt.hawaii.gov. But I'll also make sure that uh, this uh, this site here has it, uh, which is the Center for Digital Government. But let me. That's a good thought. We'll announce it at lunch. We'll okay. <clears throat> And I'll put all the YouTubes and everything. But everything you see on, at this conference will be made available to you. So please, yes. Um, what security measures are you utilizing to protect all this data? Oh, great question. OK. So that's somewhat complicated. But uh, I will say that at the state level, uh, one of the things that we're doing is making sure that some of the data <coughs> that is in the, everything in the state, anything that's privacy related, I have data leakage protection software is a tool that we use so that if, if, if it's leaking across the boundary out of the state into the internet, I can check it. So uh, uh, not, an, not an NSA type software, but uh, I, can, I can check that. Uh, there are a lot of other things that we have to allow the programs to tell us in terms of how they do the data classification. Because sometimes when you link data together, you can have something called mosaic effects. So we look at that. So I think from this standpoint, there's a lot that we're doing with security but for privacy, as you're mentioning, we're trying to protect that and make sure it's, 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 uh, it's protected. For privacy PII information. The real thing that you're asking about security itself is a larger question. And in Hawaii, I think we need to investigate a little bit more and look at what those common frameworks are. And that's why we have this data council. We need to agree as to one, one person's ceiling is another one's you know, fourth floor. Right? We have to come up with some common normalization. I know uh, Brother Pankaj Banot is there. He is an incredible, uh, uh, you know, leader in uh, DHS and is doing a lot of amazing things with data. He's got a lot of data. He has to make sure some of that stuff is protected. But now with this kind of tool, I mean, I don't even know what Brother Pankaj can do with this. I mean, it'll be tremendous. That's the point. We have to just make sure we have this discussion, and that's why we, did, we have the data council. So we don't have all the answers yet. But we're also bringing in some White House uh, tools that we have available, like at data.gov. We had a very clear workflow process. Uh, they're giving it to us. It's, it's available in open government. And once we do that, we'll allow everyone to look at what is the decision on what this government can do regarding information. When you put link information together, you can, you can make something of it, and that's a security concern. Also, we have the Information Privacy and Security Committee, which I chair, and we're looking at the data as well. So I think it'll just take a little bit of time, but uh, we're, we're going to get there. Okay, so with that, uh, I'm sorry, one more question. Yes? I have a question, and that is, um, right now what we're seeing is in part driven by the openness of the data that's being leaked. Yes. Um, what are the measures that you are taking to It's organization culture. I believe it's changing. I believe the world has changed because citizens want to hold their government accountable and, and they want transparency. But I'll ask all the panelists to speak, please, uh, Blake. Well, I think that the law that just passed will be a major initiative towards that. And so uh, there's actually an expectation that we'll have to uphold it. Okay. I think also that the idea of the commoditization of data is going to be really important. So we're seeing a lot of private, small businesses that are essentially growing up around data that's available from the government. 
Um, some examples, G um, well, GIS data is obviously a big example, but if you think about GPS, how frequently you're using GPS, <coughs> that's an open government data layer. Anytime that you look at weather data, that's a government open data layer. And so the idea is that we're seeing um, on a macro and a micro level, lots of data sets that are gonna be heavily relied on around app development. And um, once the gate floodgates are open to that kind of economic development, I can't see too many people pulling back and trying to close the doors to access that information and data. Christina? Um, I think there's a fine balance between transparency and service delivery and then the um, concerns about public access or over privacy, uh, release of privacy. So I think it's going to be a lot of finding the balance as we move forward slowly and as people become more comfortable with what the limitations are and what can be expected and what's not acceptable, it will um, develop slowly. Jesse? I think it's a generational thing. You know, um, if I can't find information online, it upsets me that I can't find it. If I can't get a camping permit online, that annoys me. If I, don't, if I can't see the GPS for the bus system, that irritates me. And I think my generation feels that way. I think we already know the kind of information that we can and shouldn't share, the public, private information about people's health and uh, you know, maybe proprietary information and contracting, but I think everything else should be open. And, and another thing too is just because that data, data is not decision making, so having data available doesn't take away the need for decision makers or policy makers. Okay, Lauren? Uh, very quickly, uh, I guess the way you maintain momentum is you start demonstrating success. That's part of the storytelling we talked about and you start highlighting problems. I know exactly what you're talking about. For example, uh, there are certain laws on the federal level that prevent uh, data related to gun violence from being collected, period, or being analyzed, period, and you can't manage what you can't measure. But you know, the more that we get out there and, and, and get people like, it's also a generational thing to, to examine how we solve these problems, we'll take data, and people, as long as people are interested in making their lives better, you need information to do that. So I think having a generational critical mass and whether the, and what contributes to that is the convenience, the modern lifestyle we have of instantly looking something up, um, that's what's got to keep it going. And you know, Sonny, you said it the best, that there's an expectation from people. Like, you can't just take that away. So that's on our side, I think. It's going to be rough to take away. Yeah, in fact, the other thing I'll just say <laughs> on data.gov, and we're looking into this, is they have actually got now 25 communities where there's a whole health community and all health data is in one area. Education, you can sort and slice by any, any which way. Their open search engine was given to us free. So we had that. All of these things is how government is now improving this thing, and really, I believe it's changing the world. I was just at a conference with Asia Pacific leaders. I mean, there were like 30 countries, including from Europe, United States, uh, Australia, New Zealand. It is changing even Asia completely into new ways they can do that. And the most important thing is now you can come up with apps with GIS coordinates and geolocated, and you can solve problems, but you can use this technology and solve problems. So as you can see, a lot of different websites, but now you're going to have one way to get to all this information through data.hawaii.gov and GIS. So again, exciting, exciting times. What I'm going to ask you to do is real quick, if you don't mind, when we give the applause, we want to have Karen and uh, 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 Deborah to just give uh, a, a, a recognition and lays to our uh, panelists. And one last, uh, one last round of applause, and please enjoy lunch. Thank you. Mahalo.